Hey, what's good, y'all? It's the White Shadow No Way and a Place to Be. I'm going to start like a kind of a vlog, vlogcast, podcast type thing on YouTube right now. And uh, I'm just going to talk about whatever, but of course, it'll be mostly music related. No surprise there. Oh, I'm going to do this uh, every now and then when I feel like it. So today, I'm going to jump straight into talking about records, and I'm going to talk about my first hip-hop record so i'm going to show you my first hip-hop albums and my first 12 inch singles and the first times i heard hip-hop and stuff i'm not going to play any music on this because of copyrights and stuff but i'll put links to all the records i talk about and all the relevant links in the description below so you can check it out there so let's just go the first time i heard rap Ever was back in 1976 and it was this record right here um, yeah typical me of uh, you know I put a marker on it so, <laughs> so other DJs and uh, train spotters couldn't see what I was playing when I played out in the clubs but uh this is a 12 inch single that was pressed in Sweden as a disco single in 1976 by a disco band from Belgium named La Belle Epoque and they had a track called Miss Broadway and the beginning of that song is a cappella intro like you can hear in the in the track the link to it I'll post below uh, with these three girls and this disco uh, band from Belgium was rhyming uh, a cappella before the the beat and the music comes in so that was in 76 I was like six years old six seven years old first time I heard somebody rapping on a record yeah, I heard James Brown and stuff like that before, and, and you know, rhyming wasn't nothing new. It was rhyming goes way back to the jazz era, probably before that, but um, this is more like the intro to this. is more like hip-hop pop type rapping, and it was also sampled by Special Ed in 1990 for his legal album on the track called Come On Let's Move It uh, that's also available on 12 inch and was produced by Hitman Howie T uh, who was affiliated with Real Roxanne and UTFO and um, those acts uh, releasing those Roxanne records on select records and stuff back in the mid 80s so um, but yeah this one definitely early on with rapping and being that these girls were from Belgium, there was no way they had been to the Bronx that early. This is from 76, so who knows where they got inspired to rap this way from. It's a short intro, but it's definitely hip-hop style of rhyming by these girls. So that was the first time ever I heard rap. I was like six, seven years old back then. Then... Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about 12-inch uh, singles because in the USA uh, it was in 1976 that they started releasing 12-inch singles commercially. Before that it was DJ only promo. So this was a real early release being from 76 out here. But uh, they did 12-inch singles in Norway uh, from like the early 70s. Like the earliest I can come up with is... Uh, the band called Dissitunes, who are very famous uh, musicians and entertainers in Norway, they did this track called Way Up North that they pressed on a 12 inch single in 1973. Um, now, arguably, uh, it was just a gimmick. I mean, there wasn't like disco DJs and producers uh, trying to, um, you know, better the sound that they could get on 10 inch or 45 acetates and stuff like that. Uh, like they did for uh, for clubs in the USA, so that that the, uh, the audio was more dynamic for the DJs out there to play. Uh, but there was another 12-inch single that dropped in '75 by a band called New Action on Camel Records. That's the Norwegian. That's that's what I regarded first Norwegian 12-inch single. It uh, dropped on December 1st, 1975, on Camel Records. The band called New Action. Um, it looks like a 12 inch single. I'll put uh, a link to a Discogs below and if I can find the audio file I will do it. I don't have it in my own collection. But anyway that, that was my introduction to, to rapping and 
to 12 inch singles out in Norway and Scandinavia with this La Bella Poc and uh, the track Miss Broadway sampled by Special Ed. It was very hard to get rap records out here. I'm from a town called Jailo in Norway. It's a small town and uh, the population now is 2,500. Back then it was more like a thousand or you know around 1,500. So it was really, you could get records and sometimes they got some gems, they got some disco and funk and stuff, but uh, rap records was a whole nother thing, they were really really hard to get. So a lot of the records I bought them later like these, uh, this is the original pressing of Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang on Sugar Hill Records from 1979. And it was actually a huge record in Norway on the hit charts. It uh, came straight in at number 5 on February 11 in 1980 on the Norwegian Top 10 Pop Charts as a 45 and I guess they might have put the 12 inch sales in there too because the 12 inch was really sought after being it's uh, 15 minutes long and stuff like that was the, the talk every, what everyone talked about like um, and that they you know they took the break from chicks good times of course but uh, that long of a record and they played a whole record on the radio with a whole 15 minutes that was unheard of it was like singles was like three or four minutes back then so but anyway this came straight in on february 11 1980 at number five and hit charts in norway it peaked at number two it stayed there for five weeks actually at number two uh and then it stayed in the charts till may 26 so it was on the hit charts in norway the top 10 pop charts yes for four months so this was a big record norway was all already into hip-hop was already into funk and disco and djing and 12-inch singles so uh we weren't all that far behind you know we had import shops that would do us and uk and european imports and stuff so it you know the um, DJing and clubs in Norway were quite up front and we got the records real early like within a week sometimes sooner of the US and the UK you know and sometimes later but anyway I bought this later that's Rapper's Delight Sugar Hill Gang known as the first hip hop record of course you, you know you had Fatback King Tim the third before that which was more of a disco funk rap record but uh, it's regarded a hip hop record too since it's rhyming on it so with the first official, you know, Rapper's Delight, that's when it all took off worldwide and it became the big hit that it did also in Norway where I'm from. But another one that, that was almost equally big in the hit charts in Norway was this one. Rhythm Talk by Jocko, that's Jocko Henderson. And it's of course a rap version of this, Ain't No Stopping Us Now by McFadden and Whitehead on philadelphia international records too so he actually used the original instrumental like you can see on the b side of this the instrumental mcfadden and whitehead so he, he actually used the original um like you know when sugar gang did it they they replayed it but uh jocko he he actually got to use the original instrumental so this came out in 79 too but uh didn't hit big in norway until 1980 and it was also in the pop charts it uh entered the pop charts on March 24th 1980 and it came in at number 10 on the top 10 uh, but it peaked at number 5 on April 14 and it stayed on the charts three months till July 14 so in Norway Jaco Henderson Rhythm Talk was almost as big of a hip-hop hit record as Rapper's Delight was around the same time Another one I can mention around then was Rapple Clapple by Joe Batan, but it didn't make it as high as the top 10 in the hit charts. Uh, then there was this, of course, Blondie, Debbie Harry, and uh, Rapture. This is the original 12-inch single from 1981. I'm, I'm showing you the original copies that I've had since back then, that I bought back then, and I've played in the clubs for forever since then so this was rapture but it, it, it wasn't like the huge hit in Norway that it was in the US and the UK uh, it actually uh, just stayed four weeks in the charts in 1981 and it peaked at number eight so it wasn't like a giant uh, hit the album down here or the American probably did better in Norway 
But, you know, great 12 inch, arguably not a hip hop record though, but more of like a funky disco uh, rock oriented uh, record with a couple of rap verses. But of course, you know, Grandmaster Flash is, uh, she's talking about Grandmaster Flash on it. And by the way, as big as he was in the clubs, he had a lot of big club hits also in Norway. He never made it to the pop charts. So that was Rapture by Blondie. And after that, it took for ever for a, a rap record to chart again on the pop charts in Norway not even Beat Street charted uh, it took until this Run DMC this album Race in Hell but the single from this Walk This Way with Aerosmith was the first time since Rapture that a hip hop single actually charted on the pop charts in Norway on the single charts and albums didn't do no this either there was like no hip hop in the mainstream in Norway from Blondie's Rapture until Walk This Way. Can you imagine that? Five plus years without any hip hop in the charts at all. You know, that's kind of crazy. But anyway, Walk This Way charted, uh, but it didn't really do that well either. It was like, um, you know, I gotta look at my notes over here. <laughs> I can't remember all this shit. I'm an old guy, you know, <laughs> getting there anyway. But um, yeah, it uh, actually peaked at number six, Run DMC would uh, walk this way and it didn't stay on the charts for longer than I don't know man about a month maybe six weeks I think actually yeah I think it was six weeks and they peaked at number six and the Beastie Boys with this album Licensed to Ill uh, that was the first hip-hop album that went number one in the USA and and you know several of the tracks were doing well in the clubs and all I used to play the shit out of Paul Revere and Hold It Now, Hit It, and it's the new style, and especially Fight for Your Right to Party. That was like uh, rebel youth music to us kids back in the day in the, in the mid-80s, and it was number one in the USA, but it it never charted in Norway. It's crazy, you know. Even some, someone as big as the Beastie Boys didn't hit the pop charts in Norway. So, uh, it's safe to say that uh, Norway for hip-hop commercially was I mean there was an underground there were kids that were into it but maybe you know maybe a couple of hundred kids uh, all over the country you know and DJs was buying some rap records and stuff but uh, in general it, Norway was an impossible country for hip-hop commercially all the way until the early 2k's the early 2000's actually is when it took off I mean it, it never really took off after the uh, the first wave with Rapper's Delight and Jocko for some reason. It, uh, it was limited to the DJ import shops and stuff like that and, and regular people just wasn't into it that much. You know, I know because I've, I've been playing commercial clubs since the late 70s. But anyway, that's a brief history of Norway, um, of hip-hop on the hit charts in Norway in the early days, back in the day. And now, to the main feature. Um, the first five hip-hop albums I copped and the first five hip-hop 12-inch singles. So let's start with albums. First hip-hop record I own, it wasn't uh, the Rapper's Delight on single or on 12-inch. I bought that much later. It was the Sugar Hill Gang album, the first one. Uh, including a uh, much butchered version of Rapper's Delight that's only like five minutes long. And then you also had uh, Rapper's Reprise and Sugar Hill Groove uh, that was big off this record the other ones were ballads and uh, a lighter funk track or two so but you know it was all about Rapper's Delight and this is kind of cool because it's uh, it's got a fold out I guess that's the same as the US version on Sugar Hill Records but this is the Scandinavian version and it's on uh, It's on SOS Records, Sounds of Scandinavia. They put out several uh, hip hop records and funk and disco joints back in the day. So, uh, yeah, this is kind of cool. It's uh, Scandinavian pressing. And it is also one of these, anyway. I have two copies in here. That's one of them. Uh, let's see. Because one of them is the exact same copy that I, uh, I had back in the days. I, I'm not sure which one, but I think probably the first one I showed you so that's cool man imagine the white shadow Norway when he only had one hip-hop record in his collection and 
this was it right here that was in 1980 my uh, I got that from my dad I was like uh, 10 11 when I got that we were in the city uh, where he's from and he bought it at the local shop for me there you know we used to go in there I used to buy either a rap record or a funk disco record or or a soundtrack back in the days but anyway the next one it took uh, a couple of years before I got another rap record because like I said it's uh, it was impossible to get them out here sometimes we were in the city but it, it was still a smaller city so it wasn't like Oslo where you could get like all the uh, latest upfront stuff not yet that's coming later but anyway the second one I had was a compilation called rap attack and it was also on SOS records I guess uh, a lot of the old school cats, this was maybe the first hip hop album they had, you know. Uh, and it's a, it's a good compilation. It has The Message by Grandmaster Flash and The Furious Five, Eighth Wonder by Sugar Gang, also It's Nasty by Grandmaster Flash, Rapper's Delight again, uh, Apache by The Sugar Gang, a uh, song called The Party Mix by Grandmaster Flash, which is The Adventures on the Wheels of Steel in an edited down version. Then it had Sequence and you know that and Showdown with the Sugar Hill Gang and Grandma's The Flash and the Furious Five. You can see here the track lists. And also on the Scandinavian label uh, SOS. So that's kind of cool. Rap Attack. Yeah, man. So this few records and then like the early days of, of hip hop, of course, like this and the Sugar Hill album, they were played to death around here. You know, <laughs> anyone who appreciated rap music in the early days in Norway would. Uh, get these few albums we can get a hold of and play them to death forward in time one year and you had herbie hancock oh, of course you know a jazz artist predominantly but he's done jazz he's done the funk and he did hip-hop and electro in the early days of course uh grab mix of dst scratching made this album notorious and it's a classic album you uh you got a huge classic on it that everybody knows that i'm going to talk about when i go through 12 inch singles so I'm really not going to talk about it now, but uh, the whole album is great. It has a great electro hip hop album from 1983 by Herbie Hancock. And uh, I think, yeah, the Rap Attack one was the first I bought here in Yalo, where I'm from, you know, in the small town. But this one too, they used to have stacks of this one too, and the Sugar Hill Gang album later too. So the biggest records, uh, I could get them out here. Out here. You know this one the import record i got from photocopy records in uh in oslo and it's the soundtrack to the to the first hip-hop movie the first official hip-hop movie wild style which in so many ways is so much better than beat street i mean i love beat street you know even though it's like uh hollywood commercialized hip-hop movie you know this one is a lot more real like that of course like a lot more the way it was back in the day and uh yeah of course the the great graffiti artwork and stuff on there so this uh, this I got in 83 and it's uh, it's got all the the music from the movie or you know most of it most of live jams and stuff like that so it's a great album to check what what hip-hop really sounded like back in the day you know uh, from the live jams and stuff like that so the wild style soundtrack album Stiski Valley's debut album called in the 80s so a bunch of these have been on 12 inch but you know getting 12 inch singles out here then really hard so this had uh can you know the classic catch the beat and it also had the the great uh hip-hop version of sexual healing by marvin gay called sexual rapping and uh never let go which was another favorite of mine so uh, uh a bit of a futuristic sound on, on some of these tracks and then some more like soul funk rap tracks and um Fiske valley on capo capo records like in the day, I, I copped this from Hit and Run Records in Oslo. That that was uh, one of the early uh, stores I, I bought from who had actually who had uh, who imported records directly from the USA. You know, before I started copying at Hot News, which is like the best uh, Norwegian record store ever. But I'll talk more about them later in another vlogcast. So beautiful record there from 1984 on Capo Records by T C Valley Cole in the 80s. So that concludes it for the first five hip hop albums I cop. Now I'm going to move on to the 12 inch singles. Yep, yep. The first 12 inch single I had that was hip hop, the first one I could get was The Message by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. And this is really a cool version of it. I have the US pressing now, and it's the, the audio quality on that is much better. 
but uh, this is uh, also on SOS Records, so it's the Scandinavian pressing on 12 inch, and it looks like this: Grandma's the Flash and the Furious Five. The message: Scandinavian pressing, sounds of Scandinavia, SOS Records, with a little Sugar Hill uh, label uh, logo right there. As you can see. And the coolest thing is like, okay, on the front here, yeah, cool. But on the back here, you, we have, you know, it's, it's got the lyrics, <clears throat> the full lyrics to the whole the message. So, of course, you know, as kids, we, uh, in the schoolyard and stuff, we were competing about knowing the most of the lyrics to the song. We were rhyming against each other. Like, you know, none of us wrote rhymes much or anything, but it was this and Rapper's Delight and The Crown and the early, really long rap tracks so uh, we competed in knowing as much of the lyrics by heart as we could, you know. So we kind of like battled in the schoolyard when we were like in fifth, sixth grade uh, in who of the kids, of us kids, knew most of the lyrics to these long rap songs. But anyway, the first hip hop 12 inch single I owned, The Message by Grandma's The Flash and The Furious Five, and I waited for like forever to get this in the mail. It took like almost a couple of months after I ordered it was like some record club type thing from a record store called tape and record center in Oslo uh, but I used to cop a lot from them they, they were quite a good DJ store back then they had um, they imported 12 inch singles weekly from from the US and stuff too so I got some goodies from them once I started calling them, calling them on the reg and just ordering records every week for whatever I could afford which was like my allowance and any other money I got I just saved it all up so I could buy like maybe if I was lucky like three to four maybe five tops 12 inch singles a week you know um, but not every week either actually that would take me to trips to Oslo to uh, several DJ import shops and uh, treat me to some records for summer holidays and this was one of them uh, one of the first uh, ones I copped there, also from Photocopy. This interesting. This has from this has a sticker, a price tag from a record store called Peaches, where it was imported from originally, I guess, up there. Um, I don't know, but anyway, it's the new class um, electro classic Jam on Revenge, the Vicky Vicky song. Early electro record I uh, I managed to get on 12 inch. I was really happy. I had listened to this on uh, on Tony Prince's uh, Groove Records Top 20 Disco Imports on Radio Lux, which was like the uh, the radio show I listened to to uh, to find out about new records and stuff. So I was really happy once I could get some of those 12s and I could. Uh, this was also bought at Photocopy in uh, in Oslo, one of the one of the best uh, DJ shops for for years in Oslo, Norway. So. Uh, yeah man, original US Sunnyview copy of Nucleus Jam on Revenge. Love it. Heavy electro tune of course, a classic and uh, it actually came out in 82 in the USA and it was actually featured before that as the soundtrack to a porn movie. So that's where club DJs and stuff picked it up and uh, it just blew up in the clubs in New York and um, it became a worldwide uh, club hit after that so this uh, record lasted for a long time and it's still great now you know most of these classics are among the best records ever in my opinion most DJ's opinions you know they still rock the dance floors and stuff like that so man parish hip-hop bebop don't stop definitely a classic man and also one of the first five 12 inch hip-hop singles that i bought more in store for you that's the one I was going to talk about uh, when I talked about the Future Shock al album from Herbie Hancock. Because this was the 12 inch that blew it blew it all up before that album dropped in with its uh, Rocket, you know, the famous classic with Scratching by Grand Mix of DST. It's a great record, it's been used in DJ battles, it, you know, it's uh, still packing dance floors now, you know, it's a great classic. And uh, yeah, I loved it as much as all the other DJs did, man, I still do. Rocket, Herbie Hancock. Only one record to go now, back to uh, the store I talked about I bought from in um, in Oslo called Tape and Record Center. This uh, this girl who was working, it was real nice to me and you know, she uh, put aside, you know, the greatest records when they got them in so I could get the hottest new vinyls and stuff for when I DJed and uh, 
one of the packages there was an extra record and she hadn't told me about it and when I opened it up I almost died because it was a brand new Grandmaster Flash and the Furious 5 record I didn't even know about it and this is that exact copy and it's of course the classic New York New York on Sugar Hill Records this is the UK pressing though by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious 5 and uh yeah, to me back then, man, as great as the message, you know, if not better when it uh, when it first dropped. So that that was like one of the biggest surprises I've ever gotten in a uh, package with vinyl records. So that wraps it up as far as um, the part of this vlogcast where I talked about the first hip hop records I ever bought, man, the, the first five hip hop albums and the first five hip hop twelve. I'm uh, not going to leave you uh, just yet because I want to talk about something else. This movie right here, The Conjuring. If y'all into horror movies, y'all know the franchise, The Conjuring 2. Uh, the question here is, and I'm going, I'm going to sound crazy now probably, but um, is this movie cursed? Um, I'm going to try and scare you a little bit now, I guess. But this is kind of creepy because um, I used to have a projector like so I could you know you can watch movies at home like you you do in the theaters you know get a blown up picture I, I had um, like uh, the size of it was like 120 inch big screen you know um, and and you know the the lamp for that projector was supposed to last for um, thousands of hours I was like cool I'm gonna have that for years you know <laughs> maybe i'll even have it for life you know because i didn't watch movies that often but uh so come halloween you know i got a bunch of movies uh, lined up to watch and then starting with some classic old frankenstein Dra dracula and stuff like that and uh, a couple of the halloween movies then i was going to watch something that's really scary you know and i wanted to watch something newer with uh where, where the jump scares really bang hard and stuff like that make you jump and uh, get the chills for real and stuff and uh, the country movies are great for that so uh, I put it in and uh, about in the middle of the movie the picture started getting really dark and I was like well I've seen this before but I guess it really got this dark you know because uh, I mean it's a horror movie horror movies get really dark sometimes but then it started getting I mean, the pictures started getting darker and darker and darker until there was no picture. <laughs> and boom, that was my lamp. You know, that, that was the, uh, the projector lamp. And it, uh, it had only lasted for 700 hours. And boom, done. You know, so it was supposed to last for, for thousands, right? Some of y'all probably had lamps last less than the 700 hours. Mine uh, had too. So there was no more Halloween, no more movies for Halloween on the projector. I was, you know, I was really bummed out, you know what I'm saying? So I was like, man, fuck that shit. They're expensive too, so. But, you know, I tried and I tried. I couldn't get to work again. And uh, a friend of mine confirmed that that's what happens when uh, the lamp's out of there. It goes darker and darker and darker, you know? So I only got through like half of the conjuring too, and I was like, well, the day after, I was like, well, fuck it, you know, I'm gonna watch the rest. So I have the computer and the Blu-ray player hooked up to the same TV. So I had the computer on. I was doing some stuff on the internet and doing some music and stuff, and then I turned the Blu-ray player on and I put the conjuring two in to uh, watch the rest of the movie, right? And I did, and you know, cool, yeah dope movie you know scary as fuck uh, then I, I switched back to the computer and there's no picture I'm not joking here <laughs> okay there's no picture I restarted the computer I just you know force stopped it because I couldn't see no no picture from it you know so I, I unplugged everything I switched channels on the TV and tried different type of plugs I'm, I'm pretty tech savvy and computer savvy so no problems there but uh no matter what I did, I couldn't get a picture. It started, I could hear the fan working and stuff, but uh, no picture. So the question now is, of course, both of those things, my projector and a computer that wasn't all that old either, uh, got ruined while watching The Conjuring 2. Now, we could, of course, just write it off by, um, by saying that, yeah, well, that's a coincidence, you know. 
it's nothing supernatural or superstitious or anything about it. So, and that might be true. I might sound like like nutbag crazy right now, but don't you think it's weird? I mean, seriously, for real, that both my projector and a computer just boom stops working just like that when watching this movie. So, you know, I looked online and there has been other people who had similar problems when watching The Conjuring 2. And I looked up the uh, spiritual symbolism of the number 700 since, you know, my projector lasted only for 700 hours exactly and then boom, done. Of course, it could have been programmed to last only that and they uh, they screwed me. That's That's possible, but... I still looked. Uh, I still checked out the symbolism of the the number 700. And when I googled it, I found that uh, the number 700 symbolizes the energy of the universe and the force of God. So I guess God wasn't too happy about the Conjuring 2, as you can see. That's it. Sleep tight, kids. Till next time, the White Shadow Norway, and I'm out of here. Good night.